Welcome to another episode of Stamper Cinema. As always, I am your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this latest episode. And this week, I don't mean to brag, but we're going to be talking about one of my favorite films from the 1990s. That's right. We're going to be talking about The Fifth Element. You know it. You love it. Or at least you should know it. And you certainly, if you do know it, you absolutely love it because it's freaking awesome. This is a movie that I've had on my radar for like forever as far as like, please let a guest recommend us watch this movie because I love it. I mean, I'm a big fan of this movie. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to enjoy. It is everything that is perfect with 1990s cinema. And the the guest that we have today, you're going to freaking love this guest. He's an author. He's written a bunch of books. Uh, super awesome personality. You're going to, this one, you're going to want to listen to everything. You're not going to want to hit that, like skip 30 seconds because we're going to have a really, really fun conversation for you. So it's going to be a long one. This is going to be like a 90 minute plus episode, me thinks. So let's just get right into it. Please welcome to the show writer, Dylan James Quarles. Again, Dylan, thank you so much for, for being on the show. I know that we connected a couple months ago. And we had a mutual appreciation for the film that we're going to be discussing tonight. But absolutely, before we start talking about The Fifth Element, I just want to know a little bit more about you. Obviously, I know that you're a writer, but if you wouldn't mind telling the listeners a little background so they might be able to get to know you where you live. What do you like to do? How did you get into writing? What do you write? Things like that. You got it. Well, uh, I live in the Pacific Northwest, which is kind of like a general term. Uh, Portland likes to sneak on there, Oregon, but I think they're a little too far south for me. But, you know, that's just me being prejudiced. I'm a Washington guy. I live out on the Olympic Peninsula, which is pretty much the most beautiful place that I've ever been. And I've been a lot of places. Um, I'm a writer. Like you mentioned, I write genre fiction. I like to entertain. I like to, you know, like take people to crazy new places, tell them things that maybe they've never heard or like break down existing tropes and kind of subvert them and have fun with uh, all of that. So I really got into writing because I was bored and I was using my imagination to fill that boredom. And I decided that I should probably monetize it because um, I was wasting it if I didn't. And it turned out that it kind of worked out for me. You know, I was able to write a few books uh, while I was working at a job that was not exactly dead end, but more or less. And um, those books took off and uh, kind of got me pegged as a sci-fi guy for a few years. It took me a little while to shake that off. And uh, I do love sci-fi. Obviously, we're going to talk about sci-fi. It's like my it's my go-to. But I wanted to like branch out, do some other things. So I write horror. I write sci-fi. I write uh, urban fantasy, I'm told, is the genre. You know, like magical, mythical things happening in the real world, in our world, not like way back in the day with wizards. Um, I don't usually dabble with wizards. Um, I try not to, at least. And uh, I've been having a lot of uh, fun lately writing horror. Um, it's kind of locally focused where I live. There's a lot of uh, neat stuff that's taking place out here. Um, kind of frozen in amber is what I tell people about my town. It was a big hub of industry back in the day. Um, and then all the industry went away. It went all to Seattle. So everything just like froze. We have these Victorian mansions. We have all these brickwork buildings. It's like super beautiful. It's like a postcard. But everything's haunted and everybody that you talk to has got a different kind of like ghost story or a uh, creature encounter in the woods. You know, this is Sasquatch territory too. So I started kind of breaking some of that stuff down and trying to um, figure out what the secret history of my town, Port Townsend was, as opposed to the really well-trod history history. So that's kind of what I've been doing lately. You, you obviously reference Portland, Seattle's another town, obviously in Washington where you're at. Like, Proximity yeah. wise, how far are you away? How far are you from Seattle? Well, as the crow flies, we are about, we're not that far actually. Um, the deal is, I'm out on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, so you got to take a ferry if you want to come out where I am, or you got to drive all the way around and take some bridges, a floating bridge. That's always fun. You know, the waves are going, it's going to. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm out on the tip of the Olympic peninsula, not on the, on the inner tip. So like I look across it, like a whole system of islands that are really beautiful. We can take ferries over to them. We do a lot of sailing out here where I'm at. This is a maritime community and, um, I grew up here. So people around here know me as, as that writer who's kind of bringing a 
little cloud of horror on our pretty little town because they try to sweep that shit under the rug. <laughs> um, but I think we need to get out ahead of it. I mean, this is like this is 2022 and everybody fucking loves ghosts. Like, why aren't we owning it? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's 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 where I'm at. I'm out here about two hours from Seattle. Okay, about two hours. OK, cool. Now, obviously, big fan of sci fi, big fan of horror. You write horror. How did you was there any what was your in what what connected with you younger that you're like, that's, that's some shit that I really, really dig. Was it, was it a movie? Was it a book? How did you, how did you get into it? Honestly, I was one of those like super scaredy cat kids. Like I was afraid of everything and it didn't help that I grew up in this town that was like notorious just beneath the surface for like being haunted. You know, everybody was talking about it, but it was like in hushed tones. And as a kid, when people are talking about something in hushed tones, that just makes it all that much more interesting. And you kind of tuck in even more. I grew up, uh, you know, being fascinated with the paranormal, being super scared of everything. Um, I think like one of the first horror movies I ever saw was The Shining. And mm. I like didn't understand how it was a horror movie because it was like too heady for me as a kid. I'm like, where are the where's the ghosts? You know, where's all the like horror stuff I've, I've been led to expect, you know, and then the elevator opens up and the blood pours out and I'm like, oh, OK, all right. I, I think I'm starting <laughs> to see what's happening here. Uh, and it's weird because like in terms of like the sci-fi and stuff like that is not my family's thing. They're very, I love my parents dearly, but they're, they don't go in for that at all. You know, it's like, it's a real, like when I produce a new book and I, I'm like, Hey mom, Hey dad, look what I wrote. You know, there's like an eyebrow that gets raised and I can tell, you know, they're like, Oh boy, here we go again. So I don't know where I got that from. I didn't get it from them. I think probably one of the earliest super sci-fi movies that sticks out in my head besides like, you know, Star Wars or whatever, like everybody watches is The Fifth Element. Like I can remember the first time I saw it. I was like 12 years old. I was like, whoa, what are we doing here with this? You know, like what it, this is sci-fi too? Because I kind of thought it was all like space westerns and Star Trek Deep Space Nine. No, no, no. Uh, Next Generation. I was always on the TV, you know, like. I didn't know what it could be. And that began my fascination. And God, I'll, I'll save it for the, when we really tuck into the movie. But man, as I was watching it last night, I was like, oh shit, I'm seeing the genesis of a lot of stuff that ends up in my books watching this movie. So yeah. Well, I mean, that very well may be a natural segue to get into it anyway. I mean, you're, if you're going to drop the fifth element, which is the movie that we're going to talk about, the movie that you selected for this episode. Heck when, yeah. Cause we, we talked about a few movies. I think the first thing that we had discussed briefly was sunshine, which is another mm-hmm. movie that huge fan. Unfortunately, I, you know, I'd already done an episode on a, for a buddy's podcast, but you're like, well, what about the fifth element? I'm like, yes, let, let's do that movie. It, yeah. it had been admittedly, it had been a long time since I'd seen it, but I remember loving it. I'm so glad that we landed on that by the way, too. Cause we kind of bounced back and forth on a couple other movies. We're like, well, maybe this one, maybe that one. And they're all good movies. Don't get me wrong. And I don't want to like slander any of them. I don't want Joss Whedon to come after me or anything, but like, <laughs> I'm so glad that we, he's got enough problems. We, I'm so glad that we landed on fifth element. Um, Cause I've been on this maximalism kick lately, which is like this term I was recently made aware of. Um, obviously I've heard of minimalism. My parents are into Danish modern. I'm talking about my parents a lot. This is like psychology or something, but, um, <laughs> it's a therapy hour. For yeah. You. Thank you. Whew, I need it. No. Uh, you know, so I think everybody's heard of minimalism, but it's like, I've recently been hearing this buzzword, like, Oh, maximalism, maximalist filmmaking. I'm like, what is that? And I start tucking into it and it's like Paul Verhoeven, you know, it's like, Starship Troopers, Total Recall, RoboCop. I'm like, okay, these are movies from like the late 80s on into like the mid, early, late 90s, kind of all in there where we're like just doing like fucking balls to the wall. Like we're kind of cramming a lot of shit in and we're having like fun with it too. Like It's not taking itself too seriously, it seems like. So, you know, when we landed on the fifth element, I already kind of like was thinking of the beats that were really fresh in my mind from the story, the stuff that, you know, never live, like never leaves my mind, lives rent free. And I was like, oh yeah, this ticks that maximalist box. And as I'm watching it last night, you know, like the music choices and they're a choice. They're definitely a choice. You know, the colors, like, uh, the over the top violence, the over the top comedy, like cramming so much stuff into one movie, car chases, gunfights, starships, you know, ancient aliens, for Christ's sake, we're doing ancient Egypt. It was like, oh my God, this is what I miss about blockbusters right now. Because I've been like, man, I thought there was something wrong with me until I watched Prey recently, which shout out Mm. to Prey, a lot of fun. Dude, I loved it. Right. I I, I, I freaking lost my mind over how great, (sighs) how great Prey is. 
I've just been like, I thought something was wrong with me. I thought, I thought like, honestly, I thought Avengers Endgame broke me. Like, I'm kind of a Marvel nerd, but I'm like the hugest Marvel nerd. I like the MCU. I saw Endgame in theaters. I was like, holy shit. Wow. Where, where do we go from here? You know, cinema wise. And then pandemic happened. You know, obviously things kind of got balled up for a while in the film industry. But then we start to get these releases, you know, oh, here we go. Finally, no time to die. Here's James Bond. I was like, bored. I'm like, all right, cool. I guess we're going to end the movie with po- on a poison island or something anyway. And then Dune. And it's like, I love uh, Villeneuve. That's his name, right? That's how you pronounce yeah. it. Yeah. I love him. And yet I'm bored. And I'm like, well, ballsy move to make a part one and not have part two greenlit. But OK, I guess we'll see where this goes. And I'm from Port Townsend. Uh, you know, that's where I live. That's where Frank Herbert used to live. So Dune is like the, you know, that's like gospel out here. So it's like the Dune heads were in attendance. It's not like I went to like an empty fucking theater and didn't have a good time. I went to a packed house of people who fucking love Dune. And I was like, it's fine. It's good, but I'm bored. And same thing happened with Shang-Chi. Same thing happened with uh, Into the Spider-Verse. Or no, no, not Into the Spider-Verse, but the live action version of Into the Spider-Verse, you know no way home. It's, it's just been happening over and over again. And so I'm like, Oh man, I'm broken. And then I see prey and I'm like, okay, thank God. It's not me. It's these movies. They're something, you know, it's like the, the, the principal Skinner meme. No, it's not me. That's wrong. It's the children who are wrong, but it's (laughs) maximalism. I need like to hit the ground running. I need to like be entertained. Like that is the point of a blockbuster. And I don't know if it has to do with like, I don't want to go on too much of a green screen rant, but like, I don't know if it has to do with like, just this like saturation of computer animated, everything that's taking place nowadays in films that makes them so hard for me to like really enjoy. Cause there was certainly a lot of computer animation in Prey. Um, and there's a decent amount of it in um, Fifth Element, not for nothing. And it's like nineties computer animation. So mm. it's like, it's even more, it sticks out, but like, there's a lot more like blending of those two worlds, like the digital and the real world in both Prey and Fifth Element. And I know we're supposed to be talking about Fifth Element, so I'll swing back towards there. But like the sets, like we're doing sets, you know, like Bruce Willis's apartment isn't a warehouse in Atlanta. It's a real space that you could see. And that kind of like brings like a comedy element or like the ship, you know, the the cruise ship at the end, like so many giant sets for these explosions to take place in that are real with like real fire. And there's that shot when Bruce Willis goes, jumping off the balcony after he after he has uh you know and, and it, it's, it's he's getting shot at by all those crazy aliens what are they called the um oh god damn it I'm, i'll pull it up but yeah 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 he's getting shot at by all these guys and and he goes jumping off this balcony and it's like there he is in the middle of the frame like john johnson with a bad die job bruce willis's body double just like (laughs) flying through the air but it's like i don't fucking care it's a real human being escaping real fire he doesn't have to look like bruce willis it doesn't have to be a photorealistic computer animated version of bruce willis i like it i'm here for it and it just fell i just fell into it so hard as i was watching it i'm like just the same way that happened to me when i sat down to do a rewatch of um starship troopers and total recall i know i kind of name dropped them already but it's like I miss that. Like, take me for a ride. And while you're taking me for a ride, don't take yourself so fucking seriously because the world's serious enough, you know? Like, Mm. so yeah, it just was just everything clicked for me last night. I fell back in love with that movie so hard. I definitely think I'll be revisiting it more uh, regularly than I have in the past. That's for sure. Because it's like reigniting my love of like (laughs) blockbuster sci-fi. Yeah. And just because you obviously are talking about like the whole like maximalism and everything and you, you, you name dropped, you know, Paul, uh, Paul Verhoeven a couple of times. I mean, shit, I mean, uh, love Robocop, but I am thrilled beyond thrilled that Starship Troopers is finding like 25 years later, finding an audience all over again. And people are now, starting to get that movie like mm-hmm. i remember watching it i remember like the preview and they use like the blur song too and you think it's gonna be like an oh, over yeah. kind of like action movie and it's a kick-ass trailer totally. and i remember watching this movie and like this is nothing at all what the movie was kind of marketed and packaged as but yeah i i remember loving it right off the bat and i remember like critically it was not necessarily super mm-hmm. well received and the actors by and large were 
kind of awful. But kind like, of awful. It, you look at it now, and it's like I think that was a choice. Like Paul Verhoeven it was, is not, it was a not an choice. idiot at all. He's not a stupid man. Like you look at any of his movies, he's putting people in those movies for a reason. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're putting Casper Van Dam in the movie because Rico is supposed to be a fucking block of wood that just yeah. has enough of a brain to point a gun in the right direction. Like. It's it's beautiful. It's a beautiful fucking movie. And I saw somebody, like a friend of mine, he put up this like he posted about it after he watched it. Maybe he's younger than me, so I'll give him a pass. And I won't name him, but he knows who he is. And he <laughs> says, "Whoa, I watched Starship Troopers. I had no idea it was such a criticism of fascism." I'm like, "Bud, yeah, definitely." And like one of the things, like since I am a writer, I read a lot as well. Like Heinlein, who wrote the book Starship Troopers. He's kind of got a lot of fascist overtones in a lot of his work as well. And I've been compared to Heinlein, and that's not something I think is in my mm. work. Just saying. But I have been compared to Heinlein. You know, if you're into him, check me out. But, like, it was almost like a, this cool thing to see Verhoeven be like, hmm, this book's a little bit fascist. And the author is thinks it's cool. So I'm going to go ahead and just really lean into it and show how fucking dumb that is. You yeah. know, like mm-hmm. – it just works so beautifully. And in a way, you see that uh, also in The Fifth Element. Like, I was noticing, like, how militarized everything was. Like, no one had any rights. Those cops came up, uh, jumping around, obviously. But when Bruce Willis, he's won the tickets to go, you know, the army's rigged the um, – the army has rigged the, the contest, uh, everything. contest so that he can go and get the stones. He can go on the cruise. And everybody's trying to, like, fuck him over so they can steal those tickets which I kind of love how like it's this like keystone cops, like this like total Mickey Mouse mafia of like bad guys who just can't figure it out. Like the absolute evilest thing in the universe hires like a fuck up, like Gary Oldman who hires yeah. successively more fuck up, fuck ups to like carry out this mission. But you know, they, they, they call in as some, like they say Bruce Willis is like, selling like illegal arms or whatever i don't remember exactly what it was so they they basically swat him and but luckily you know the priest has switched you know the ids on his door uh and so the cops go to the wrong door but they you know t- they go into the apartment complex they stick some little card in the slot they punch and some button all over the loudspeaker it's like this is a police action everybody go put your hands on the yellow circle nobody has any fucking rights they're in their homes right like it's total fascism like the cops just come and arrest you if they want to put your mm-hmm. hands on the yellow circles or else you know like yeah. and it's all over that movie like the military kind of industrial complexy stuff but it's not like beating you in the head with it. And there's definitely no like resolution at the end of it other than the, like um, Lilu needs to be convinced that like, even though mankind is super warlike, you know, they're still worth saving. It's kind of like the only time we're sort of touching on like, Hmm, we're pretty fucking violent on our own without absolute evil just coming for us, you know? Um, but yeah, it's just, I love that whole like vein that was seemed to be running through, um, like all those '90s blockbusters, like it's almost like they saw the writing on the wall way before we did. Like culturally speaking, like hey, everybody, let's start telling the kids now that fascism's bad because like their drunk uncle at Thanksgiving, he's not getting it or something. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot to unpack there. But if I were to kind of like hone in on something, I mean, obviously you you, you mentioned uh, like military, you mentioned government, and look no further than look who like the the president of everything is is fucking mm-hmm. like like tiny lister right he's <laughs> yeah. supposed to be this authority and you know obviously he's, he's a big dude but nobody's going to look with a straight face and say oh yeah he's definitely authoritative of uh, somebody that can that can run the show yeah. and it, it's just completely like kooky <laughs> that's everything like that- that's like the future that they live in though. Right. Where somebody yeah. like that is the only person like that can run the show. It's almost like the strong man trope, but like literally, you know, like, right. yeah. Like the only person that could actually hold this crazy society together is somebody who looks like he could seriously like put you through a wall. If you looked at him sideways. Now, like Dylan, we've been talking for, you know, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes or so, maybe longer, but we haven't i don't even think we've kind of broken down what this movie is technically oh about other like w- do you feel comfortable just kind of like you know like cliff notes version what yeah. this plot is a, is essentially about yeah so the film is about this like cycle of evil that happens every 5000 years um where these planets align and this sort of like 
ill-defined evil, I'm using air quotes for the listeners at home, will arrive and try to wipe out all life in the universe. And there's these aliens that have been battling it or kind of like holding it back for, we don't really know, eons. They're the oldest race. Their language is even called the divine language. And they have these stones, four stones, one for every element. And then they have a fifth element, which they say a lot in this movie. They're definitely saying the fifth element all over the place. And when you bring them all together at the right time, you will like unleash this weapon. Again, it's kind of ill-defined until the end of the movie that will defeat evil and spread light to every corner of the universe. So that's sort of like what the thing of the movie is, the driver. Um, the film itself starts uh, where I think most movies should start in Egypt in the early 19s. We've got this. We have Luke Perry making an yeah, appearance. Yeah, Luke Perry for like two minutes. Of all, yeah, I know. For like, and he's like one of the top build casts when you're watching. He is. Like, he's like <laughs> in like that like top billing. Yeah, and he's only in there wild. for like the first two minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, it's totally crazy. Dylan McKay, man, he was hot as fuck then. So we had to make sure he got some screen time. But uh, they're like, you know, he's there with some professor and they're like in this Egyptian tomb and whatever. And it's all kinds of ancient alien stuff all over the place. And then the ancient aliens literally show up. And, you know, they got the key and there's a priest and there's all this great stuff going on. And that sort of like sets up the thing like the evil is coming. You got 300 years to figure it out. And then we jump ahead to 300 years and we have got this really crazy future, um, which I think is so like deep for how little they actually spend like how little time they actually spend explaining it. It's all visual. You just like, you see this future. It feels alive because it's really well thought out and the evil is on its way back. Now we're in space. Uh, we're highly militarized, but it doesn't matter. None of our weapons can do anything to defeat this evil. We need the ancient aliens with the four stones and the fifth element. And they come right on time. But uh oh, Gary Oldman, who is our villain, one of our villains kind of has hired these like mercenaries and they shoot down the ancient aliens before they can get there. And the stones are lost. And it's like all hope is lost, except for we have one survivor. And that is Mila Jovich when they kind of like clone her. And, you know, then she's on this whole adventure basically to with Bruce Willis, who's like this hapless cab driver, ex military dude to kind of like get to the stones, beat Gary Oldman and his henchmen beat these mercenaries kind of even like going against the military who's supposed to be saving the world. Like everybody's working against each other is what I, I love about this movie. And they have to, you know, get the stones in time to stop the evil and, you know, spoiler alert, they do, but like so much insane stuff happens in between there that it's like, it would take us an hour or more to break down all the story beats, but more or less it's about, you know, defeating ultimate evil it's all about the setting, though. It's all about the world in which this adventure takes place that makes it so specifically maximalist and so fun. You know, I mean, you could take these story beats and you could drop them into any number of films and you would recognize them for sure. But it's the world that Besson creates. It's the fact that Bruce Willis is giving a shit in a movie, which I don't even remember the last time I saw him try. You're seeing it all happen, and it just comes together in such a way. It's like totally iconic. I feel like it's one of these iconic movies that maybe doesn't get the credit for being as iconic as it is. I guess does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally, totally. Did I did I miss anything? Anything else stick out? No, I mean that's pretty darn like right on the nose as far as what this movie is about. And you you, you tap into kind of the 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 insanity that this movie is in. It's a very very specific world. When I was watching it. Although, you know, made a couple of decades later, they both were trying to tell their own kind of story with a lot of like visual cues and what the future looks like. But there's some like some some like serious, like strong vibes with like Terry Gilliam's Brazil with mm, when you yeah. look at this movie and just the way that they were really in that kinetic. Movie. Pardon me? Really kinetic. Both really movies. kinetic. Gil Gilliam has a super kinetic style, which I see with the best in movies as well. Yeah, I mean, shit, where that movie just had, like, like tubes and everything. And, mm -hmm. and this movie just very, very bright colors. And everybody has ridiculous hair, which is totally. perfect. And, the outfits uh, are so wild, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Like, everything. Bruce Willis is wearing this, like, jacket vest at one point. It, <laughs> this, to say nothing of the fact that he has a backless tank top 
for most right. of the movie. A tank top, like a strapless, backless tank top, which mm-hmm. is totally so. But he's got this like vest on at one point, and it's got like all these like blocky things on it. And I'm like noticing that they seem to have like ammo clips in them. And this is like he passes through airport security. I was like, I don't even know what that is, and I don't have to know because that's part of the world, right? Like it just is all this stuff is just there for you to enjoy. And it's all put there to kind of like, I I hate to keep using that word, but it's all put there for that kind of like maximalist kick of just like overloading the shot with stuff, but still framing a shot, still making it comprehensible what's happening, which is another big credit I'll give this movie. I could follow that action beat by beat by beat, like the blocking. Like sometimes I watch some of these like later Marvel movies, looking at you, Shang-Chi, we're fighting goblins coming out of a mountain or something. We're riding dragons. It's like, I don't know what's happening anymore. I've lost the characters in all the sea of Mm -hmm. activity and action, but I'm watching Bruce Willis's stunt double, you know, leap off of things, fires going everywhere. We've got Chris Tucker, who we haven't even talked about yet, which is a travesty in the most insane outfits with this character that's so over the top. And it's like, I can still tell what's happening. Snorkel like that. Like, his hairdo. Yeah. (laughs) He stole the show, I felt like. And it's crazy that the comedic relief shows up, like, well into the film. You you say comic like comedic relief and it, it is true but there's so much that is like like comedic about this movie we I mean we 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 talk we kind of like scratched the surface a little bit but we we talked about uh, Tiny Lister as the president right right but I mean, you even look at Ian Holm as uh, you know Cornelius but mm. he's somebody that's important and he's you know like a priest and everybody's completely over the top in every way so all these institutions that people lean on whether it's um, for political, whether it's spiritual, everybody's completely out of their element. Nobody, yeah. uh, not to use a pun intentionally or anything. Out of their fifth but, element. Even. Out of their fifth element, exactly. But all these entities, uh, whether it's military, whether it's religious, whether it's government, nobody knows what the fuck is going on. How even our villain that we're tracking is a total buffoon. in, in so it is. Yeah, He's so it is. Yeah, so yeah like, I was... It's like what I was saying, like everybody's like working against each other because like everybody is so bad at their jobs mm-hmm. and they and they only focus on their jobs. Like nobody can see the bigger picture. It's like even Bruce Willis, like when these military folks show up to be like, we need you to help us save the world. He's like, yeah, I need you to hide in my freezer. You know, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. it's like everybody is just like the buffoonery is cranked up to 11. I was thinking about Cornelius's um, – and I'm forgetting his name, but he, he has like this assistant or or like a – or like a trainee or something like a younger right. priest. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like every time that guy's in the shot, he's like jumping at every sound. He's like twitching. There's like he's like bringing so much physical comedy to a character that pretty much amounts to not a lot except for at the very end when his pessimism is what like helps them unlock the secret of the stones. Mm-hmm. And it's just like that's a choice, you know? Like they made that choice. They said, "Hey, as you're going to be in the shot. You could either stand there doing nothing or you could twitch every time Bruce Willis raises his voice. Please do that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, just a few quick little technical things, just because, you know, just to, uh, obviously for the listeners that maybe haven't seen it, we've already referenced that Bruce Willis is our star. He plays Corbin Dallas. Gary Oldman is our villain who plays. What is his name? Zorg. Zorg. <laughs> he has uh, three he, names, but I can't remember what they yeah, all are. It's just Zorg. That's how I remember um chris tucker who we just referenced ian holm plays vito Corno- uh, cornelius and then of course mila jovovich jo- jovovich 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 yeah it, it, mila. It's, mila yeah we just mila uh luke perry which we referenced brian james uh just mm-hmm. to throw out you know just somebody that's just a great like sci-fi reference for those that love blade runner um mm-hmm. tiny lister mentioned Lee Evans, who has a weird, like, tiny cameo in this movie. And is there anybody else that I'm forgetting? Probably. Um, well, you have, like, John Neville. He's, like, the – you have, like, all these character actors. Um, oh, like, yeah. all and the military tricky. guys. For, for those that are, like, a big fan of, like, trip hop from the 90s, Tricky, the the singer-musician guy. Yes. Yes, you know, exactly. I don't know if, if Tricky's ever acted in anything else in his life. And I, I, I don't understand – why he's in this movie other than he's just got a really cool voice and he looks like an alien himself he but, does and the way he speaks it sounds like he has like some kind of vocal modulator going on mm-hmm. that's just how he sounds that's just how he sounds i almost feel like besson's like oh gary oldman's like number two could just be anybody again it's like that idea like he could be anybody but what if we be what if he was tricky 
And so right. these like 15 lines that he has, I'm sorry, boss, won't happen again, boss. You know, what if they had that voice instead of just another voice? You know, he's like, it's, where, how, how did we lose this? How did we lose this like thread of films meant blockbusters specifically were meant to be a spectacle for the senses, you know, like they were meant to like really overwhelm you with more than just visuals, more than just special effects, you know, like the fact that like you mentioned that Tricky's in there, like somebody's watching that movie for the first time in the theater being like, holy shit, what's he doing in this film? You know, like what a weird choice. Like we just don't get that anymore as much I feel. And I, I don't want to rag on modern blockbusters too much. There's plenty of people doing that. But as I'm watching it last night, fifth element i'm just like is this my like uh decade of films like i never would have thought the 90s would be something i'd want to revisit but as i'm watching it and i'm thinking about all these great 90s movies that i've watched recently I'm like oh Dude, man. the 90s like, is a great decade for for cinema yeah it kind of was right it kind of was and i was wondering too like i want to talk a little bit if it's cool with you about like the script too like from a mm-hmm. writing standpoint like it has there are like two times that I clocked, I'm probably missing it, where like the script is written in a way where two different events are taking place and we're cutting between them, but mm-hmm. they're following the same like narrative arc. Yep. Like we're moving the for- story forward, but we're cutting between two different conversations. And I was like, what a cool, like just flourish to throw in your movie. Like, you know, it's it's like it's you could tell that like the director that Besson had a hand in writing because as as they're writing it he's going and i'm gonna shoot it like this and this is how you know like when the ship is taking off and they're getting ready to fly out to the um cruise ship and chris tucker is like seducing a lady and the as and as it's cutting between him seducing this lady but then it's cutting to the pilot running down his checklist but everything that he's saying on his checklist is like you could see how it was immediately being sexualized by Chris Tucker. It's just like what a weird joke to do in your sci-fi movie, but like totally appreciated by me, the viewer, because I'm not fucking bored, am I? You know, I'm I'm laughing, I'm enjoying it. So it's just a well crafted screenplay too, which is another thing. Uh, I'll stop myself. It's it's a really well crafted screenplay, and I just had total appreciation for it watching it like now having written several books. um, And I I honestly think I have not revisited that film since I really began writing in earnest. Uh, So it's like, oh, shit, I really appreciate what's happening here, like just on the page, which probably is what helps them, you know, go forward and like, get people to sign up to be part of this movie, get them the budget, whatever, whatever. Um, Where I feel like we've kind of like, things have maybe kind of inverted a little bit now. Like it's not a great script that sells a movie anymore. It's like the potential to franchise it and you know, like what intellectual property it's already based off of. I'm probably going to have somebody screaming in their car listening to this podcast, but I don't believe the fifth element was based on any existing intellectual property. I don't think it was like a comic book, right? No, it was something that he had written when he was a teenager originally. Like I think he, I think uh, Luke, is it, is it be- like he's French, right? I just always want to say like Luc Besson, but I, I don't know. If it's, yeah. Um, Luc Chris, Chris Crescent but, or Crescent? Besson. Yeah, exactly. Besson. Luc Besson. We're American. Yeah. Um, Luc Besson. Besson. And uh, it was something that he wrote as a teenager. And then obviously the movie, he, he finally made it, you know, in his late thirties or whatever. Obviously he had done The Professional, which fucking crushes if you've ever seen that or if I haven't seen oh, yeah. it, you need to watch Big it time. immediately. Gary Oldman is rocking it in yeah. that movie too. Yeah, and that, that's, I think, just in itself is a conversation just to talk about Gary Oldman's acting choice uh, that, he, that, he, that he chooses in this movie with, with his kind of uh, country bumpkin-esque and then the, the hair that, you know, like, mm-hmm. and even his teeth, all of it. I mean, there, there's a lot to unpack just even the with Gary. The soul patch. Like, yeah, the soul patch, like all like of it. An exclamation I mean, point. For his yeah, face, <laughs> the, the weird like plastic thing on his head, totally um, weird. Just a lot going on, a lot going on. The limp, he's limping, yeah. and there's some sort of metal sound with the limp, mm-hmm. and it's like that to me smacked of an actor's choice. Like he goes to Luke Besson, Besson, whatever, and is like, we'll just call him Besson. Besson, hey Besson, I think my character, or well, he's British, you know. <laughs> Boy, Besson, I think my character, I think my character has a limp. And uh, I think that he has some sort of cybernetic leg implant or something. I mean, how, how hard was that for them to catch in post? You know, just put a little metal click every time mm-hmm. his heel stepped down. And he just did that. 
like you, you see the actor's choices taking place in the movie, especially like, I mean, I love Bruce Willis, Die Hard, you know, Fifth Element. There's great Bruce Willis uh, performances. He tries in movies from time to time. Um, he used to. And he, he's great for the role. I mean, he's he, he's probably the perfect I'm glad they went with him and not like an Arnold, like a hard body, like total beefcake kind of guy. I'm glad that Corbin Dallas was like, he's a little lithe. He's a little slippery. It works. And we're definitely kind of doing the diehard thing. They take over the ship. There's a terrorist, you know, take one man takes them on. All that stuff is great. So I'm glad that they went with Willis, but it's like Gary Oldman is fucking outclassing everybody in this movie with his, just like his facial expressions. Like when the bomb, you know, when he, he plants a bomb on the ship, and then he stops the bomb and he has to go back to the ship and he stops it at five seconds and he has this sigh of relief. And then, you know, the, the mercenaries, they've planted their own bomb for honor, as they say, and it pops up and it's this like totally crazy looking again, we're going way over the top. Like we could just do like a, a little black box. That's kind of what Gary Oldman's bomb was, but we get this like triangle thing that comes up out and like unfolds and comes up out of this briefcase. And it starts at five seconds and Gary Oldman's face literally just says, mommy, you know, he makes that <laughs> face. It's like Looney Tunes. Yep. He just makes that, but he, but he does it with his facial expression, a little quiver of the lip or whatever. And it's like, you could tell like, this is a fucking actor mm-hmm. in, a, in this totally over the top movie. And I mean, Ian Holm too. I mean, he's, that guy's an actor with a capital A and he's all over the movie being totally goofy and silly. Um, yeah. So it's, it's just got a lot going for it. I don't know if your listeners can tell, but I like this movie. I mean, it's impossible not to. I mean, well, I guess it is possible not to if you don't get it. And it's not like kind of like, oh, we're smarter than you. No, but there, mm-hmm. it's something very, very stylistic. And right at the outset by using Maximalist, I mean, that that's what this movie is at its core, right? You can mm-hmm. lump this movie into a Robocop or a... Um, you know, Starship Troopers, even though the violence yeah, used right. in that is obviously substantially more bloody. But we're at a PG-13 in this, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Even though we sneak in some like out of focus nudity and stuff, which again, right. like the 90s, what? I love it. I'm not I'm not at all opposed. Um, sorry, I cut you off. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, but it all works. And, you know, obviously Gary Oldman had worked with, you know, with Luke before and uh, they they did a completely different approach, but shit, even in that, you know, Gary Oldman had some really interesting like uh, acting choices that he made in that. But I think that's also Gary Oldman is the fact that he's a fucking chameleon. Every movie that mm-hmm. he's in, he's completely, completely unrecognizable. And it, it's so specific to that movie, even even movie that's pretty, you know, by the numbers. He, yeah, we're just going to you're going to play a police chief, but I'm going to make right. him very, very Chicago. And I'm mm-hmm. going to make him look like everybody's father. And, you know, and he's you talked about the Dark Knight and all those, uh, the, the Nolan Batman movies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's totally true. Like he does disappear into that role. Like honestly, and I'm not just being like hyperbolic or, or anything. I fucking forgot that that was the same guy. Right. Like, and I just did a rewatch of those Nolan Batman movies because I was, the, here's another movie that left me kind of cold, The Batman. I know it's good. I'm well mm. aware. I don't need anybody to tweet at me. Please don't send me any hate mail. It's fine. I like it. It's a good movie. But I was, I left the theater kind of fucking bored. And when I, so I went home and I was like, well, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm tired of Batman. And I put on those Nolan movies. And I'm like, no, this is cool. I like this. Uh, And Oldman is killing it in those films. And he's not like really, doesn't seem like he's doing a lot when you think about everything that's happening in those movies. Like trucks are flipping over. uh, You know, we've got um, the Joker, you know, Heath Ledger given the performance of a literally of a, of a lifetime. Like there are people that are like uh, outshining him in like a really traditional sense. And yet he is just crushing it as that character. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching the fifth element last night and I shit you not, I fucking forgot that that was the same guy. You know, I was thinking of the professional, I was seeing the connection between his character and the professional and Zork. I was seeing that connection um, probably because I was thinking of the fact that it's the same director, blah, blah, blah. It's kind of the same decade whatever but you're right like he is a such a chameleon even when he is like even when he's peacocking like the fifth element Mm -hmm. like even when he is saying like literally hey look at me look at my crazy hair look at my limp look at my outfits look at my country fried accent you know like he still just disappears yeah it's it's wonderful 
And I, I feel just another movie, just because it was another 90s film and he, he does something kind of similar in that he's completely over the top, but he still disappears is shit. Look at him in true romance, right? As Drexel. Oh my God. Again, I forgot that he was in that movie too. Yeah. And, you know, he, he's he got like the, the dreadlocks, which basically he did that, that whole look, but created this, uh, you know, uh, character choice by his vocal stylistics of, you know, trying to pretend to... Um, he was black, essentially, his whole yeah, character. Yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's a, that's a choice. Again, like, I, it's so it's weird. It's like the 90s had so much problematic shit going on. Like, I don't want to lose this Gary Oldman thread. So let's we can circle back to maybe the problematic stuff because, you know, we, we live in the era we live in. We do need to talk about it. And there is some stuff in The Fifth Element. And, you know, not for nothing, the professional, you know, it's Besson has... Besson, he, whatever. He has a thing that he does that people have noticed, and they're not wrong. Um, but with Oldman, um, I was thinking also, uh, you know, another film that he just absolutely kills it in. And it's sort of like always stuck out of my mind. is like one of the cinematic, like Titanics, like it should have been fucking perfect. And yet it struck an iceberg and sunk was Dracula, uh, mm. Coppola's Dracula. And mm-hmm. that iceberg was trying to get fucking Keanu Reeves to do a British accent and Winona Ryder. That is an iceberg that was man-made. So there's mm-hmm. really literally no excuse for it. But if you if you can like maybe watch that movie like I don't know maybe just like watch it on mute in a bar with subtitles with like closed captioning, I bet you dollars to donuts that's going to be like top twenty movies you've ever seen in your life because it's shot amazingly, it's, it's gorgeous, acted pretty well. Just those, oof, those accents and Gary, but Gary Oldman as the titular Dracula. I mean he. He he disappears. He he's a chameleon in that movie as like the two different versions of Dracula that we meet. You know, yeah, it's like I mean, he played like shit. I think he played like three different versions. I mean, because obviously the one like way back and then oh, right, right, right. his like old the version and then his yeah. younger version. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's almost like I mean, I would have bought it. I probably wouldn't have because I know enough now about films. I I, I went to college uh, to be a filmmaker, not for nothing. Where'd you go to school? I went to the Evergreen State College in Olympia. Oh, uh, our, Olympia, my second Washington. guest on here that went to Evergreen. Nice. Yeah, it's a great little school. It's a secret creative hub. And while I was there, I made many, many a short film. I actually made two um, shorts, about 40 minutes each. Because uh, while I was attending Evergreen, uh, H.P. Lovecraft's work into the public domain. So I had a college roommate. We all had this college roommate who was orb obsessed with H.P. Lovecraft. Um, and so he was like, we can do this. We can touch on it now and we won't get sued. Not like we ever would have anyway. It was like totally stupid. So we, we started making like HP Lovecraft adaptations, um, way back in the day. Anyway, that is beside the point, but it's fun. It's a fun aside, but like in Dracula, I'm looking at old, old, old men, old Dracula and young Dracula. And honestly, there's a part of me that if you would have told me that was played by two different actors, I, I kind of would believed you because he just like. He just vanishes into that movie. Just he just becomes the character. You're not like thinking I'm watching a Gary Oldman movie because they. I mean, even the accent and all of it, uh, which is like why it's such a super travesty <laughs> that he's then sharing the screen with Winona Ryder, who's trying to hold on to this British accent like she's got one finger on the steering wheel. You know what I mean? And that car is going off a fucking cliff, and Gary <laughs> Oldman's over here just like he's just slaying it, like he's just channeling this character. But yeah, I mean. I still guy, love it though. I still I love do it. too. I still watch it pretty much every Halloween. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible for me not to love Winona Ryder and, you know, and uh, uh, Keanu Reeves, even though not working, not working. Fire. I still love it because I love I, them both. I'll, I'll like, I'll like get to that part of the movie where Keanu first gets to the castle and he's really having the kind of like his first breakdown that things are not going so well. And he's shouting at Dracula about the fiery blue and <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just like rewind and watch that again. Rewind yeah. and watch that again. It's like, I need that to be like my ringtone or something. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Keanu yeah. trying to say the word fiery blue inferno in a British accent. <laughs> Not just a British accent, but like an 1800s British accent. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Queen's English. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do we want to get into the the problematic uh, element of... Uh... <sighs> we probably should. I mean, Mila Jovovich, 
and we're all we're talking about how she's perfect the whole movie they say she's perfect over and over and over again and she, you know she's very beautiful um they they say that she's perfect almost as many times as they say she's the fifth element but she's a baby let's just call it it what it is she's literally a baby she's a baby in a in Mila Jovovich's a 1997 Mila Jovovich's body and Bruce Willis is all over it you know and it's presented as being sweet and cute you know like she um he tries to kiss her while she's asleep and he admits you know later and immediately when she takes the gun and points it at his head mm-hmm. that that was not a good idea and he shouldn't have done that but he still does try to do it and then you know later in the film when she comes to his apartment with the priest to steal the tickets from him that he's won that when the army rigs the um, contests so that he can go and get the stones. Um, it, you know, there we're, we're doing this whole kind of like, again, it's kind of almost like a, it's almost like a, like a Scooby, it's not Scooby Doo. It's like, it's like definitely like some kind of like old comedy bit. Like, Oh, we got to stick the, um, we got to stick the army guys. Oh, Lilu's at the door, stick the army guys in the fridge. And then Lilu and the priest come in. Oh, the police are at the door. I got to stick you guys in my bed. And stage Lilu, play in my, as well. Yeah. We're kind of like shifting people around and there's this, and it's, it's totally presented for comedy, but the, he's, he puts her in the shower and the shower disappears up into the wall. It's all very I kind of, it's, it's a neat um, apartment the way that he, it's designed. And I touched on it before. It seems like a boring thing to talk about, but it is kind of, Cool, it's thought out. Um, anyway, she's in the shower. It goes up into the ceiling. And when everything's done and the cops have come and, and have violated everybody's rights and they've arrested this guy next door um, who says, smoke you when yeah. the cops smoke put your you. hands in the circle, which I love that. I'm going to start saying that to people. Um, Bruce Willis, you know, hits the button and the and the shower descends, you know, from its wall pocket. And there's Mila Jehovich. And, uh-oh, she's like a little silly kid who got wet in the shower. And she's shivering. And it's just like the whole energy is baby. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's hot. It's hot baby. Because it's directed by Luke Besson. And mm-hmm. um, that's the same energy. Thank God at least Mila Jovovich is not a child. She right. just acts like a child. You know, Natalie Portman was a literal fucking child. Yeah, in, she was in like 13. The professional. Yeah, yep. that is some dicey stuff. Like, I still do love that movie because it's a great film. It's a, just a it's just a good film. And, you know, bless the French for pushing us into uncomfortable territory sometimes. Because if we had it our way, it'd be all fucking Steve Rogers. And I sure do wish I could dance with Peggy just one time. Gee Willikers. You know, it's sexless kind of cinema that we're stuck in right now. But, you know, it, it just needs to be addressed, I suppose. Um, I still love The Fifth Element, don't get me wrong. And she kicks so much ass in this movie, too. Like, literally, she's kicking the shit out of these aliens. Yeah, quite literally. You know? While he's doing it with a gun, she's doing it with her bare hands. But, like, there are these moments where she lapses into being this, like, helpless baby. And Bruce Willis is fucking here for it. You know what I mean? Like, he's all about it. He's totally down with this baby inside Mila Jovovich's body. You know, like I think some of the saving grace um, is, is the fact that she's an alien, you know what I mean? And you see that a lot in like, you see that a lot in like, it's a trope that exists in sci-fi that has to do with humans interacting with aliens like E.T. Like E.T. comes from like an advanced, like at least Elliot's not trying to fuck E.T. like Bruce Willis. Well, (laughs) I'm sure there's a version of that movie where he is, but like, E.T.'s kind of a baby, a dumb baby too, but the motherfucker came from a spaceship from across the universe, you know, like he's not stupid, but he kind of is like, Oh, I like beer. And that's like, it's a trope you see. Um, I actually recently watched that Jeff Bridges movie with, um, the actress is going to kill me who plays Marion in Indiana Jones. Um, and I think it's like a John Carpenter movie. Uh, it's Wait, uh, with Karen Allen. Yes. Yeah. 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 What is that movie called? Oh, Starman. Yeah, he's Starman. a dumb baby. He's a dumb baby. Yes, yes, he is. But it's, yes, he but is. it's Jeff. It's, he's a dumb baby alien, but it's Jeff Bridges. So it's sort of like, it's like, okay, all right. Yeah, it's, I don't have a problem with that. You know, why I don't have a problem with that probably speaks to my own like biases that are problematic in and of themselves. I'm sure I am a white man, if you can't tell by the sound of my voice. But um, like when we're doing it with Mil Jovovich and like, not for nothing, like we are certainly playing with like, the fact that she is beautiful. There is like I mentioned, like 
some nudity slipped in here and there. There's a lot of like jokes made about the fact that she's not aware of how hot she is or perfect, as they keep saying in the movie. So like to me, that stood out as obviously the most like sort of problematic thing. But again, big trade up from the problematic stuff that's going on in the professional, where mm-hmm. we're like we're doing those sort of that we're hitting some of those similar story beats, but it's with an actual child or a right. very young actress singing like a virgin. Yeah. I mean, that's not, that's a, that is not accidental. That's not happening on accident. Right. So, you know, and I think I've seen it in some of his other movies too. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think like what other really big, like, uh, tentpole Besson movies there are. Um, obviously Lucy is newish. Like he likes mm. kick-ass women, which mm-hmm. I, I totally appreciate that. Like, but they're, they're, you know, who else likes kick-ass women? Joss Whedon. Not to keep bringing that guy up, but we all know now, you know, like yeah. sometimes, sometimes that can be a cover for another thing that an, a director or a screenwriter is exploring, you know? Yeah. Lefem Nikita was uh, the other oh, one. There you go. There's the other yeah. one, like similar kind of. Yeah. So, um, does it totally turn me off of the film? No, not at all. Did I kind of like look out of the side of my eye at my wife when Lilu comes out of the shower and she's shivering like a dumb baby and Bruce Willis, like, oh, Lilu, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, come here. Oh, 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 oh. And it's like, bro, you were just trying to kiss her like 10 minutes ago. Now you're talking mm-hmm. to her like she's your, you know, fucking child here. So it's like, it, it needed to be brought up, right? I mean, it's a product of its time. It's a product of the director. It's 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 a story beat that he keeps coming back to again and again. So I think it's fair game to talk about. Like I said, does it turn me off in the movie? Totally. No, because mostly we don't lean into it too much because it is a PG-13 action movie. And probably I want to believe that, that uh, the co-writer, um, whose name is escaping me, uh, cause he did, he had a co-writer on the, on the, on the project. Okay. Robert came in. I, I want to believe that came in kind of was like, Hey Luke, or let's, uh, let's kind of get back on track with this like uh, sci-fi story that we're telling here. You know, we got <laughs> those stones evils on its way. We got to get the stones. Bruce Willis can't uh, try to fuck this baby for too much longer. Right. Okay. Moving on. So, you know, it still works by and large because you know, the alien trope sort of allows for us ex- to explore that in a way that's not totally gross. It's a little still gross. That having been said, you know, I mentioned Steve Rogers, G. Willikers. I sure do wish I could get a dance with Peggy. Uh, sexless cinema that we're in now. I did kind of find it refreshing that there was a, a little bit of a sex scene at the end of this movie. Because it's like gone from cinema. I don't know if you've noticed. Like even James Bond is barely fucking anymore. Like in mm-hmm. these new movies. Like I don't know what happened, but somewhere somebody at a very high level made the decision uh i guess that we're not doing that anymore in movies and it's kind of just vanished so i'm watching this Besson movie and i'm like oh boy this is a little dicey and then there's a sex scene at the end and i'm being like the biggest hypocrite in the world by being like hey all right look at that there's a little bit of actual you know human uh, emotion taking place in this because not you know i don't know if your listeners are aware of uh humans have sex uh, it is a huge part of their lives. So it's kind of nice to see it in the film. This you just know. in. This just in. You were created by sex. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, just because obviously we've, we've talked a little bit about sex and like the problematic element. You know, it, there is something that's always tricky about like watching a movie that was made in the 90s or 80s or shit like the 50s or 60s. And trying to put it in the lens of like modern like times as far as like we look at things completely different. I mean, you look at like a James Bond movie in the 1960s. It's like, yeah, he's he's like slapping women and stuff. Yeah. I mean, shit, even like Sean Connery was on like record saying that, you know, like hitting women was okay anyway. Um, Yeah. And I mean that he as a person said that type of shit. And um, but just even looking at art in the context of, of when it was, you know, it, it, there is something, there is definitely a conversation we had about it. Obviously the nineties I mean like tits and ass were, that was, that was like the tits and ass decade really, quite frankly. I mean, yeah. Verhoeven certainly was uh, played a big part in it. And- There's nudity in all, I mean, it's, there, there is co- I mean, total recall three, there's a woman with three boobs. I mean, if that doesn't tell you all you need to know about, 
maximalist filmmaking, you know, why two boobs? We're doing maximalism here. Throw another one in there. You know, like yeah. there's to- so much nudity in Starship Troopers, the, the, uh, the co the commingled showers, you know, the, yeah. what I love, what I love about that, not to get back into Starship Troopers, but I mean, it, it's like I said, it's just a movie that somebody brings it up. I'm going to start talking about it. You have it's to do just, it. just how irrelevant the like the nudity was in that in that scene Not everybody's everybody's naked they're, You're so they're right. having literal like conversations about what they're gonna do like you know like why are they serving what's going yeah. on like the whole reason why they're why, why they're serving and they're all taking a shower and that like, scene could take like place grilling them. It could, that scene could take place in the mess hall that scene could mm-hmm. take place on a bus but it takes place in a shower and they're all naked yeah. and i do kind of love that because it's almost like it's it's like challenging you in a way it's like it's it kind of a joke right like at mm-hmm. least in Starship troopers um it's like saying to you like a can you pay attention while there are this exactly. many breasts on the screen exactly <laughs> and you were talking about like it can be hard to go back to some of these films that are a product of their time you know with looking at them through the lens of the era that we live in and for the record, you know, just because Captain America doesn't fuck uh, Agent Carter doesn't mean that I think Me Too should go out the window and that movie should just have tons of nudity and creepy Harvey Weinstein guys should just be like casting couch to like mm-hmm. every pretty model that comes along. I think that we are moving in a good direction. I just think it's a, a maybe a bit of an overreaction to some really, really bad stuff that was happening for a long time. And I think it'll probably all iron out eventually. But what I like about going back to some of these older, uh, it seems crazy to say that the 90s, late 90s is older. But what I like about going back to some of these older films and is that there's like in, in the same way that Verhoeven is challenging you during the shower scene to be an adult and pay attention to the dialogue because that's actually character building right there in that scene. Like we're literally saying why people are in the army. We're building their characters. Um, And then we're going to shred them apart. Like they're all going to get fucking shredded, but you're going to care when they die because we fucking told you who they are and what their hopes and dreams are in that scene. Mm -hmm. when they're all totally fucking naked. So like, in the way that you are challenged in that scene, you can kind of like carry that over if you would like to, you know, rather than writing off a movie like The Professional because of the super problematic elements, you could challenge yourself, you know, to um, process it. You know, you don't have to hate it. You don't have to love it. You don't have to condone it and you don't have to damn it. You can just look at it and sit with the feelings that it evokes. That's like literally what art is supposed to do. And I think that's kind of why I have been struggling lately with like modern blockbusters, especially um, because I feel like they have really lost their art. Like blockbusters used to be artful. They were over the top. They were crazy. But the person who fucking pioneered blockbusters was Steven Spielberg, you know, and he is an artist too. You know, there's, there's stuff, there's, character stuff that's going on there's there are uh thematic elements that are taking place that are meant to sort of challenge you like evoke emotions in you like putting kids in peril in jurassic park you know um kids getting eaten in jaws that's a blockbuster where kids die show me a fucking blockbuster now where kids die please you know what i mean like oh the adventures the sky opens up and the aliens come pouring out you don't see a goddamn person die at all you see a million aliens die but you don't see any people die ever because ooh, we don't want to have we don't want to have a bad time at the movie do you so it's like we've lost that like sort of like ability to challenge ourselves in our own viewing and i'm not saying like i understand that the world is like pretty like bleak right now it's kind of rough um it seems that way, at least. It really seems that way, um, even though some of the data suggests that things are better than they've ever been before, right? But I don't want to get off into that. But like, I I understand the need for escapism that you don't want to like bring the problems of your life into your escapist uh, fiction. And 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 as a writer, I'm really keenly aware of that. Like, I write. I'm not writing the great American novel. If I ever do, it'll be completely by fucking accident. I write entertainment and I write escapist entertainment. That said, I kill characters. I won't tell you which book, dear listener, but in one of my books, I kill a pregnant woman. I don't 
do it gleefully, but I do it because it seriously challenges the characters and the reader. People write me. I wrote that book many, many years ago. People still write me and tell me that they have strong feelings about that when they read it. And I think, good, you should. It's entertainment. It's escapism. But I should challenge you at least a little bit here and there. If you don't feel anything when you read a book, watch a movie, then why did you do it? Did you do it to just turn your brain off? You could do that with TikTok now. You don't need a movie to turn your brain off. You could turn your brain off with social media. So when I'm like sitting over here going, ooh, ah, Bruce Willis wants to have sex with this alien baby, I'm like, and that makes me feel a lot. And why do I feel those things? And why do I have these opinions? And it's like suddenly more parts of my brain are like lit up while I'm watching a space shoot them up ancient aliens fighting evil 1990s movie with a really weird soundtrack really and, weird. and Chris Tucker's just screaming, you know, in my ear. I'm, th- I'm also fucking thinking though too. So, mm-hmm. you know, what does this mean? I don't know, dear listener, it's up to you to decide, but I think there's something to be said about challenging yourself just a little bit. You know, when you go back and you look at these old things um, and not just immediately writing them off, like, because they have problematic elements that don't necessarily jive with what's going on right now, which again, I think is good. I think we are moving in a good direction um, culturally, but it's, it's important because like, what's the point of moving in that direction if you don't reflect on where you came from and how that all fits together. So weirdly serious tangent to go on for a movie where there's a a blue alien that sings techno opera and has stones inside her stomach, but there it is. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dylan, I, that was, that was excellent. That was a fun little, fun little uh, rant to go on. Dig it. Um, We we've been chatting for a minute. I want to kind of get into just a little bit of of trivia in just a second, but if there are any like little like final nuggets or anything else that you wanted Mm. to discuss, um, we we can get into it. But like I said, I just want to get into just some fun little, Fun little factoids, if you will, oh, just I because like, I feel like we should cover them. Uh, if I could say anything else about this movie to sell it to somebody who hasn't seen it or to resell it to somebody who has, but has been dancing around that rewatch. Um, the the conclusion, the end, um, it's like not an action set piece. I, I didn't count how many action set pieces were in this movie. Um, but the very end where they're in the, ch- they're in the chamber, they're in the ancient temple and they have to like uh, figure out how to unlock the stones to me felt like an action scene because it had this like timer element. Like the, 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 the evil is rushing towards earth to destroy earth. So they're really under a clock and yet we're not shoot. Nothing's being shot at. Nothing, nothing is no, there's not really a lot of like kinetic stuff taking place. No one's leaping around. There's not stunt just or like anything. Not, we're looking at a block of stone and trying to figure out how to make it come alive. And yet like I was on the edge of my fucking seat. So like this film finds ways to entertain you even in like something that is kind of meant to be like the, we're sort of wrapping shit up. And yet I'm still like, it's still it's like it saves the biggest edge of your seat action for the end and not a single shot is fired. And I just mm-hmm. kind of love that. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I, I that I that I was thinking about just because we had been talking about Gary Oldman and you just said like shot fired. What I also love about this movie is something that I only just noticed the last time I saw it is our central protagonist is Bruce Willis and our central villain obviously is Gary Oldman's character like like on screen, obviously evil is really what the, the true villain is, but our like snidely whiplash villain that we're kind of tracking in this movie is, is Gary Oldman. They don't have any like scenes together other than just right. like walking by each other. So like you think there's gonna be a battle between these guys. They never even meet in the entire that, movie, the which is just in the crazy. elevator. Yeah. Bruce Willis and, and company get on an elevator. And at that exact moment, Gary Oldman gets off the elevator That's elevator and, and Oldman looks at their elevator as the doors are closing. He doesn't see them though. Mm-hmm. And, Again, like that's a screenwriting beat that is so fucking smart. It's like so clever. Um, Because in a way, like Bruce Willis is like proxy, like part of his party, uh, Ian Holm. He has scenes with Gary Oldman. He has that great scene with Gary Oldman. About with the cherry. 
he saves his fucking life. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> He's got Which that is, weird like anteater like, I love weird that. thing. Yeah. But you're 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 so right. And honestly, I did not even pick that up until you mentioned it, but you're totally right. And it, that's it just cool. Yeah. It you know, I had seen the movie a lot. I remember like I had mentioned I saw it when it came out, um, when I when I was a teenager. When I think of this movie, it's so weird that I've got this movie and the Spice Girls connected, but they both oh, came out like around the same time. That's and, funny. And uh, when I think of this movie, I just remember being a teenager and seeing this movie and then just, you know, going home and Spice Girls were always on fucking MTV at that time. And so mm-hmm. when I think about this movie and I think about that and I think of like Mila, Amelia's ho- uh, hair in this movie, which they had to change into a wig because her hair kept on falling out because of all oh, like no. the orange dye and everything. It, just, it brings me into like a specific time. So yeah. um, kind of just like get into a few little like tidbits that I, that I think that I think of in the movie. Um, now, none of these are my own thoughts. These are things I just, I was able to like pull, you know, on the internet and everything, but the fifth element at the time was the most expensive film ever made outside of Hollywood. What? It had a Where 93 mean- million like $93 outside. million dollar budget. What does outside of Hollywood mean? Was it made in France? Well, basically, you know, at the, uh, so whether it was filmed, you know, when it, like a movie that's uh, whether on location or in this case, it was filmed like in France or okay. I'm pretty sure it was filmed in France for the most part um, on whatever like studio lot of whatever they, whatever Luke used there, but it wasn't filmed in LA. Wow. And, and at that time, you know, I, you know, that's obviously been crushed, but I mean, $93 million in the nineties. It's a lot of money, shitload of money, shitload of money even today. But obviously everything is filmed here in Atlanta and, you know, movies are made with hundred million, $200 million budgets. It's like, and they're not, it's like nothing. They just, it's, it's like, I remember the first time, um, I remember when, uh, the first $200 million movie came out, it was Avatar. And I was like, holy shit, $200 million to make a movie. Because before before that, I think the most expensive movie that I've been personally aware of, and I'm sure that there was others before it, was um, uh, Lord of the Rings. I was like, oh my God, like $100 million a pop, you know, for those Lord of the Rings movies, I believe. Um, Again, don't send me death threats if I'm wrong. Um, But like the fact nowadays that like, I don't want to dog on Shang-Chi. I like three quarters of that movie. But the fact that like a movie like Shang-Chi can cost like $200 million dollars i'm like where did it go where is the money is this all just like is the mcu just like a giant money laundering operation and we're all just like party to it and i don't even know like i just i don't see it on the screen when you talk about the budget for the fifth element like i immediately i think of the sets and they are kind of amazing they're great sets in the film Mm -hmm. like and i love that about it like people are in a location they're in a physical space and they're interacting with it and it really comes across and i think of you know, um, the props, you know, like how weird all the guns look, like how overthought everything everything is. Uh, so I can like, I can like, you tell me a number and I'm like, Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I I could see that. I can kind of imagine the amount, the nugget that went to Bruce Willis being the big star to Bruno, you know, and I could see the nugget that went to Jehovah, a rising (laughs) star. I can see, I can see these, I can see the money getting piecemealed out here and there. But I see it in the sets. I see it in. I even see it in the effects because I know those '90s effects. You know that the cab driving chase scene that couldn't have been cheap to do. And um, I don't see it though in some of these newer movies. When when we he- we hear these astronomical numbers, you know, that are attached to some of the blockbusters nowadays, I just totally don't even see it. Mm-hmm. I absolutely see every penny of that. What was it ninety three million? Yeah, I see every penny on the screen. Um, and I totally appreciate that. It doesn't feel like a waste of money to me. It doesn't feel like, oh man, so many starving babies could have been fed. It's like, yeah, no, that's they pretty much used it all. Pretty economical, actually. Ninety three, not too bad. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, another a fun little nugget is while we may know, or maybe you do, or maybe you don't. The listeners probably don't know, but uh, Lupuson and Milia, uh, Mila uh, Jovovich, they were they were married. They were married oh, for wow. a couple of years. But what a lot of people don't know is that he was engaged at the time that they met on the set and he was engaged to a diva. Uh, so he, the, the, the opera singer he Ooh, was really? engaged to, he met wow. her on the set, left diva, married uh, Mila. Mila. Why can't I ever say her name? I've, I've never been able to say Mila. Mila. And uh, they, were, they were married for a couple of years, but, obvi- but it just kind of like a... She's married to Paul W.S. Anderson, not to be confused with... Paul Anderson. The other, 
Not to be confused with the other Anderson, yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. So she's she she's married. So she's been married to a couple of different directors. That's interesting. I mean, now she, you know, I got I have nothing but respect for Mila Jovovich. I'm not like at all what you would call uh, a fan. I'm hardly even aware of those Resident Evil movies. I know that there are many of them. How many? I couldn't tell you. Uh, They're like the Underworld movies to me. I'm aware that they exist, and I have zero interest in finding out what's going on in them. I've seen like maybe one or two Resident Evil movies. But I mean, like that girl works. You know, she is in movies, and I kind of have to respect that about her. And she doesn't just show up in like a movie and like say a couple lines. Like she's getting thrown around, jumping all over you. Like she's like she's a very physical actress. So uh, that's crazy that she was married to him. I, I literally didn't know that. You've, you've introduced a new piece of trivia to me. So hopefully it comes up on a trivia night somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's all I've got, really. But if you are wanting to test your knowledge, I can put you through a little, a little movie quiz. Oh, I would love to. Obviously, Corbin Dallas is our protagonist, and he has a really yes. hysterical conversation with his mother. Yes. And um, that she hasn't seen him in a while. And... The question is, where does Corbin's mother live? The moon. The moon. Well done. Yes. I, 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 I clocked that this time. Uh, there's some line about uh, th- that she went there for like the weightlessness of it. And I kind of was like the voice acting, uh, the, 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 the actress they chose because you only ever hear her voice on the phone didn't sound like old enough. For somebody, A, to be Bruce Willis's mom, sounded like it had been his ex-wife, and like to be old enough that they needed to go to the moon where it was like less gravity for their joints. But uh, it's so it stuck in my mind for that reason. It's like a criticism. But uh, maybe I maybe I knew this was coming. I didn't. Mm-hmm. For the listeners at home, this is not rigged in any way. Question number two. I mean, this one's easy, but we, we know that the the stones are named after specific elements what 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 are the the what is the correct order of the stones what what do they represent uh earth wind fire and water yeah earth air fire water correct yeah earth mm-hmm. air fire water and then the fifth element mila jovovich hot now, alien baby that's correct that's now, everybody should know that's an actual element it just hasn't made it out <laughs> in, the journal, in the scientific journals yet yeah, alien baby <laughs> we'll um be there. Bruce Willis is referred to by a military rank several times in this movie. Do you recall when the general comes to see him at his apartment, what military rank he's given or he's associated with? Ooh, this is I'll give you I'll get I'll make a multiple choice for you. OK, lieutenant, captain, major. General. Ooh, it's either it's either lieutenant or major. I want to say it's. I want to say it's lieutenant. It's major. Damn, major. I should have gone with major. I mean, it's major. It's a maximalist movie. I should have known it was major. It's a major thing. He's a major guy. Okay, that's fine. All right. I, can... was that number? I think that was question number three. Yeah. Okay, number four. What does Lilu eat at Cornelius's? Chicken. Chicken says it's good. Good chicken, chicken. <laughs> chicken I, told, I literally told my wife as I was watching that, I was like, if uh, this ever existed in our world uh, i would be in i'd be fucked if you could just pour a couple of nuggets on a plate and it turned into a whole roast chicken in like a second uh oh <laughs> um, final question for you when the police ask what does corbin say he's classified as oh classic they say, he's classified as a human he says he's not but he's classified as what he says negative i am a meat popsicle that is correct. <laughs> and they totally buy it. <laughs> and they totally buy it. <laughs> That's right near the scene when the guy says, smoke you to the cops. I, yep. That whole scene. Same scene. Like, there's so many like belly laugh moments in this movie. Like, For sure. I, I know you're trying to wrap it up, but like when he gives Chris Tucker the gun and he told, and he, and it's got pointed against that alien mercenary's head and he tells him to just keep the gun pointed there. He's doing something else. And he says, what do I do if he moves? He says, squeeze the trigger. And then a few minutes go by and he, he turns to him. He says, Rudy. And Chris Tucker just screams and shoots, <laughs> pulls the trigger. And he goes, is he going to be okay? Corbin, Corbin, my man, Corbin, my man. Classic. It's a good one. And for the for the listeners that might still be on the fence, I don't know why you are. But critically, 
Critics loved it. 71% uh, tomato meter, which is really respectable. Audiences love it even more at 86%. It's grossed over $200 million in the box office. That was worldwide. And again, those are 90s numbers, which adjusted for inflation. Really Mm -hmm. respectable. Yeah, big time. What did he go on to make after that? I wonder what doors that opened for him, Besson. Besson. Um, I don't know. I don't, um, I'll, let me take a look right now with, by the, the cheating thing that is IMDB, uh, fifth element. Um, let me do just director stuff because he obviously pretty prolific writer. Oh yeah, um, definitely. And the messenger, producer. the story of Joan of Arc was his next film, oh, which did not, which had Mila Jovovich in it though. Did, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did oh, not so do fantastic. Not, I remember it not, <sighs> I don't think it plays to his strengths, you know, to mm-hmm. be honest. It just, it lacks, like when I think of like La Femme Nikita, there's all that neon everywhere. It's totally got like a maximalist vibe. Yep. And how do you do maximalism when you're trying to do like historical yeah. fiction? I have not maybe seen that done yet as I'm thinking. I actually haven't seen, um, what is it, Benedetta? I know we keep talking about Verhoeven, but I haven't seen Benedetta yet. Me neither. And I wonder if he brings a ma- I know I've heard really good things. I've heard... I've heard a lot of things. Uh, It sounds challenging. I should probably um, practice what I preach with all that talk of challenging yourself as a viewer uh, and get around to watching it. But it's a period piece too. So I I wonder if he brings the maximalism to to that as well. Mm -hmm. Food for thought for me. Uh, Dylan, I had a fucking blast, dude. It's fun talking to another writer. It's It's fun talking to somebody that that obviously has a passion for the craft as another person that, you know, just went to school for, for film and writing and everything. It's, it's always fun to meet somebody that's very, very similar to you. Uh, so Absolutely. I thoroughly enjoy this man. Hopefully this uh, has been a dream for me, to be honest. Like it's a, it's a literal dream come true to talk about movies with somebody who likes talking about movies and know that someone out there will be like, he can't even remember the name of the mercenary aliens. <laughs> it's, it's great. I love it. It's what I always want. It's what I do. You know, I listen to movie podcasts and, uh, oh, what do you like to listen to? Oh, well, so I'm going to be repping your podcast when this episode comes out big time. I've already been repping it. Uh, I oh, love nice, my big, my big love. My podcast love is we hate movies. Mm. Um, the four guys from New York city, they, they kind of do what we were taught. We talked about a little bit off air, you know, they, they take you through the beats of the story, but they go on these crazy tangents and they all kind of have backgrounds in um, improv. A couple of them do at least. And they're all sort of like connected to the industry in some way, not like super directly. Like they're not like directors or like directors of photography or whatever, but they're all really fucking knowledgeable and super funny guys. And over the years, it's just become like part of my like life, uh, listening to we ate movies i'm a patreon subscriber to one of their to their top tier patreon hey if you're listening guys you know i i, I pay for some of that and i love it every <laughs> second of it uh so that's like that's my go-to bad bad movies typically bad movies but they have a patreon tier where they talk about good movies that they love as well and um ever since i started listening to them you know years ago on my commute I was like, I fucking want to do this. Like, this is what I want to do. You know, I haven't gotten to do that since college when I left that environment of like like like-minded film nerds, you know, who just like their idea of a good time is like, yes, getting drunk, but getting drunk while watching and talking about either a good movie or a very bad movie. And like, it's just what I what I aspire to do with my life besides writing, you know, hopefully I get rich enough as a writer that I can just have people come over to my house and we can just get tanked and watch awesome movies and not awesome movies and then talk about them later on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What's next for you? What are you, what are you working on anything right now? I am. I'm working on a series of short stories. Uh, I recently adopted a son, my wife and I, um, Oh, awesome. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. It's the best thing I've ever done in my life easily. And, um, by a country mile, by a city mile too. Um, so novel writing has taken a bit of a pause because it's just really in-depth process for me. Um, like I said, I write genre fiction. I tend to write, uh, science fiction, fantasy, action, adventure, horror. And these all take a lot of like research and thought. And I do give a shit about my characters, um, in a big way. So, um, it's too hard to take that deep dive 
um, because he requires so much love and attention and I'm more than happy to give it to him. So what I've done is pivoted to writing short stories. Um, I'm from this town called Port Townsend. Like I mentioned before at the top of the show, it's got a long history of like spooky occurrences, ghosts and hauntings, all these Victorian mansions, uh, people sighting creatures in the water were surrounded on three sides by water. There's all this stuff has been around since I was a kid. I've started taking these stories. Some of them are based on like actual Port Townsend lore. And some of them are based on the stories I told myself as a kid growing up here when I was a Frady cat. Um, and I've started to turn them into short stories. They're all interconnected because they all take place in Port Townsend, but you start to see characters overlapping into other stories. And my idea is to take maybe write seven or these, maybe six or seven. And when all is said and done, it will more or less function as kind of a novel. But for Mm. now I'm releasing them as short stories and fuck if they aren't just doing really well. I've got two out now. Um, The series is called a secret history of Port Townsend. You can find it on Amazon. Um, You can find it in some bookstores if they're cool. If they're not cool, tell them to be cool and carry the fucking book because it's not that hard. They're short. They're perfect for like my sister reads them on the ferry because I, I told you we're ferry folk out here. We go on boats. We go places. So you want to get somewhere, you got to take a ferry. My sister reads them on the ferry. She says they're perfect for like a ferry ride. Um, I've got two out now. One's about silkies. I love, I love that kind of stuff. And the other is about ghosts and ghosts plus uh, and I'm working on a third right now that's about witches, but it's actually really about it discussing Port Townsend's not so talked about history with spiritualism in the um, late 19s and uh, early 20s, you know, when the rich uh, had no better use for their money than throwing it at charlatans who could conjure ectoplasmic, you know, apparitions of their dead uh, family members and whatnot. And I'm kind of saying, like, well, maybe what if it wasn't all bullshit? And, um, I'm kind of toying with that. Also playing with the fact that a lot of these old Victorian mansions are now working B and B's and like how absolutely abysmal and horrible would it be if your life was to like have strangers come into your house and like Mm. stay in it and you had to like cater to them. And then like, what if they were not good people, you know? So that's sort of the Mm. premise of the third one that I'm working on right now. But yeah, that's what I've got going. And then I've got, uh, the ruins of Mars trilogy. That's my tent pole. Uh, sci-fi trilogy, hundred thousand copies downloaded and read for that. Um, certainly my biggest claim to fame up until I won a best indie book award for my last book, which is called there be monsters. And, um, I am a maximalist writer. I'm realizing this about myself as I go on this maximalist, uh, watch party of movies. I'm seeing it in my books. You know, I like to pack a lot of shit in there and have a lot of fucking fun because I am trying to entertain. Well, dude, Dylan, I've been entertained, and I'm sure the the listeners have thoroughly enjoyed this one. If they want to find you, how do they how do they get in touch? They they go to your website. Where can people learn yeah. more about you? Sure, you can go to my website. It's djqfiction.com because I have a long name, Dylan James Quarles. Like I was telling you at the top top of the show, I should have picked a pen name, but oh well. Uh, you can find me over there, djqfiction.com. There's links to all my books. There's also like press releases and cool stuff and like a, like a blog that I don't work on nearly enough. Um, I'll put, you know, links to this podcast there uh, as well. And um, you can also find me on Facebook, uh, Dylan James Quarles. It'll find my author page. Um, you can find me on TikTok, author, at author Dylan James Quarles. Uh, I'm killing it on TikTok right now. Somehow <laughs> as a man who's 36 years old, <laughs> I, I, you know what? It's my film degree is finally paying off, you know? So, uh, those are, those are the fun places to find me right now. Well, awesome. Again, Dylan, thanks a lot, bud. This has been a great time. Yeah, it's awesome. Anytime, anytime you need somebody, you've got my number. Again, major, major thanks to Dylan for, for popping on the show. Holy cow. What a conversation, right? I know that you definitely got something out of it. Maybe you've seen the movie, maybe you haven't seen the movie, but we're talking like high energy, right? So I think we did a good job of convincing you to give this movie a look and definitely check out Dylan's work because pretty freaking awesome. And I didn't know this going into it, but he went to the Evergreen College, which this is now the second, maybe third guest that we've had on here that went to Evergreen. 
I only mention that because of the fact that one of my one of my dear friends uh, went to Evergreen State College uh, that I knew growing up. Hello, Molly. Molly's not listening. But anyway, so I think it's really cool. Obviously, Washington State in general is like, like perfect. You know what? I'm going to shut up. I don't need to hype how awesome Washington State is. He already did that. Am I right? No. Uh, Dylan was awesome. And so was this episode. So thank you, everybody, if you've gotten this far into the, into the podcast to hear my little closing rant. Please do me a favor. Like, listen, subscribe, rate, review, all those cliches. But honestly, please, yeah, on it, really, 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 really leave a review. Hop on whatever platform you're listening to. Give us a five star. Give us a little little review blurb that the guests are awesome and that nerdy host, he's pretty okay too. And then share it on whatever form of social media you have. If that's too much, then just go directly to my website, stanfordcinema.com and leave a uh, review directly on the website that I've got. There's like a little blurb that says reviews. Click on that. Do your thing. And while you're at it, also take a look at the episode. Uh, uh, while you're at it, do yourself a favor. Look at the epi- episode show notes and I'll have a link for Dylan. So you can see his website and it'll uh, directly click uh, link you to his books, his bio, what have you. And then I'll have some more information on the fifth element. But that's about it. That wraps it up. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. We will see you next time on another episode of Stanford Cinema.